Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this time together. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would instruct and teach and guide and direct. That we would truly bring you glory in and through our lives. And that you would just reveal yourself to us, your purposes, your plans, whatever you would have for us. And Lord, that we would see you in a greater way. But as we gather, we ask that your Holy Spirit would teach us. And we thank you for the time together. In Jesus' name, amen. There is quite a bit to cover, uh, so we'll break this up possibly into three parts. The first part that we'll be talking about is why, or basically why in regards to the uh, battles that Israel are facing, kind of like why are they happening, what's going on, what are the historical things through Scripture that we see that would cause such anger and resentment, such hatred for God's people. And so we'll talk about that this time. Then, after, we'll talk about the what, the, the prophetic Scriptures that we may be seeing as a beginning of what's unfolding in the Middle East. We'll be discussing chapters in Ezekiel, like 38, 39. We'll talk about parts of Zechariah, and we'll walk through those passages together. And then thirdly, I want to look at how the world has been groomed and prepared to receive their Messiah, if you would, the Antichrist. That the world for a, a, a quite a season has been being prepared. That this whole woke thing and everything that's going on is preparation for Antichrist to come and to be received by mankind. But also, at the same time, that the Holy Spirit is preparing the bride of Christ, the church, to be ready for their Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so, this is happening before our eyes. And the Lord would have us to be ready in the times that we're living in. The Lord would have us to be mindful of where things are at because he's doing a work and his work is being accomplished. In fact, we will talk about this later, but there has become a great divide in the world. And it's so stark that we can see it before our eyes. Good and evil, if you would, are so polarized, they're so on opposite ends. And those that believe in evil according to the word of God, they're entrenched in it. And they have been deceived and they think it's good. And those that are truly God's can see through the lie and realize that is nothing but evil. And this divide and this, this contrast is getting greater in our lifetime. And the answer at the end of it all is what side am I going to be on? And am I going to be staying or you staying in a gray area or trying to exist, halting between two opinions, if you would, as the scripture says, kind of playing around in the world? Or is it going to be a decision you make that I'm going to be a follower of Christ? And so that is going to be challenging us not only today, but as we go through this series on Israel. The best place always to begin, I think, is in Genesis 1.1. You don't have to turn there. I'm just reading one verse, as you know it to be. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This fact needs to be known that this is God's world, that he created it. He has all authority over it. He made it. He owns it. And it's up to him to deed and divide it as he sees fit. 
that God steps in and he declares what will be. Much like when you read about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 we read, and I'll just read a couple of verses. In verse 1 it says, Now concerning the spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. And then you read some of the gifts of the Spirit. And then in verse 11 it says, And all these worketh that one and selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he wills. In the Amplified Version, it says all these things, the gifts, the achievements, the abilities, the empowering are brought about by one and the self-same Holy Spirit distributing to each one individually as he chooses. That it's up to God in the things that are his. He divides them as he sees fit. And like I said, I think this is very important that we understand that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, as it says in Psalm 24, 1, that God has decided that he would give his people the land of Israel, that he made that decision. And so to know that God has decided that and God is the authority over it, I think we as believers have to begin there. And so in Genesis chapter 12, and you can turn there. I want to kind of take my time and unfold this for us. Because I think it's very important. So in Genesis chapter 12... we see God calling out a man named Abram, or later was changed to Abraham. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse at thee. In thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Well, we know that through Israel, through the Jewish race, through the Jews themselves, that all the earth truly has been blessed by the birth of God's Son, Jesus Christ that God truly blessed the earth by giving us the Messiah, the Savior, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the one who died on the cross at Calvary for our sins. God truly has blessed the world through him. God tells Abraham the land that he would give him and his descendants He begins to describe that land as we continue. It says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son. And all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran And they went forth to the land, into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sichem, unto the plain of Moreh. And the Canaanite was then in the land. So during this time when God passed through, the Canaanites were in the land. But it says, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there build an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And so here Abraham did that. He built an altar. He he knew that God was giving him and his descendants a land. 
He knew that God was going to bless him and his people. Again, it was God's land to give. No one has a right to dictate to God what he will and will not do. God declares what he's going to do. And God declared, I will give Abraham and his descendants this land. And so he did. Now, God told Abraham that when the sun or the sin of the Amorites is full or at its peak, that God would send the descendants of Abraham into that promised land to bring judgment upon the Canaanites. Now, this judgment upon the Canaanites was already declared by God back in the day of Noah. When Noah built the ark and he and his sons came into the promised land, that there was a sin that took place with one of his sons, and God had said that Noah's grandson, Canaan, would be judged because of that sin. And so God declared this. If you look back in chapter 9 of Genesis... So if you look in chapter 9, and in this it says in verse 24, And when Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done unto him, and he had said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant, and shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant that God had declared that Canaan, or Canaan's descendants, the Canaanites, would be the servant of Shem. We see also in chapter 10. As you read in chapter 10, it tells us that, and Canaan begot Sedan in verse 15, his firstborn, and Heth, and as you follow through, you read all of these names that were from the descendants of Canaan. You read in verse 16, the Jebusites, the Amorites. So here, these descendants are there as part of the descendants of Cain. Canaan, Canaan was to be judged by God through Shem. So the Canaanites were the servants of Shem. But if you read the scripture and understand that Abraham is a direct descendant of Shem. So Canaan, or the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, were to be the servants of Abraham. That they were to serve them. That means they weren't to own any land as servants of Shem. And so God said to Abraham that there will be a time when your descendants come into the land that I want you to judge the Canaanites because at that time their sin that started here with Noah would continue to grow and fester into a point where it was out of control. That they would then never turn to God. And so God said, when the fullness of the sin of the Amorites has come, I will send Abraham your descendants into the land to destroy the descendants of Canaan. Well, God did that. He sent, when he called Moses... And he called Joshua out of Egypt, and he told them to go into the promised land, that God sent Joshua and Israel into the land of Canaan 
to destroy or to judge the Canaanites. And through that, as we see, the Canaanites, as I look back in history, they actually occupied the area which is now modern Gaza. They occupied the coast there of the Mediterranean. They, they occupied that land. And God had said that I want you to go in and destroy the occupants of the land. Another group of people that also occupied the land were the Philistines. The Philistines were not native to the land, but they came and they occupied that area. We know the Jebusites, they continued to stay in the land and occupied um, the, the areas of Jerusalem. And what happened with Israel over the years, that Israel came into the land, but they never fully took care of those enemies. That they continued to stay in the land. In fact, they tormented David when David was king. The Philistines were constant enemies against Israel. And here, God wanted Israel to come in and to rid the land of those enemies. But they didn't do it. And they continued to remain in the land. Now, it was God's land to give God gave it to Abraham. God gave it to his descendants. God gave it to the Jews. And those that came into the land were actually the occupiers of the land, not Israel, who was deeded the land by God. But I see as one of the, the problems that, that happened was that Israel, upon receiving the command of God to come in and judge the inhabitants of the land, that they never completely removed them. And the land of Israel continues to be inhabited by the enemies of God and the enemies of the Jews. And it's a constant fight in that way. It's a constant battle. In fact, now the people are referred to in that area as the Palestinians. Well, since the statehood was uh, proclaimed in 1948, Israel would continue to make agreements with the inhabitants of the land. Even then, they were granted the right to come in the land and have the land, but then an immediate uproar from the Arabs that were in the area, would come against Israel. In order for peace, Israel would continue to make concessions and agreements with the inhabitants of the land. And it's very hard to make agreements with people that don't want to live side by side with you. Their heart and their desire is to annihilate you, to destroy you. To remove you from the face of the earth. Very hard to have those kind of people on your border. The Canaanites wanted to destroy them. The Philistines wanted to destroy them. And battled with Israel constantly. And then now what you see is the inhabitants of that land have that continual spirit about them and want to destroy Israel. Now, this was Israel's land way before um, Islam was even a religion. It, it was before any person was labeled with the title of being a Palestinian. But it was through that time, and I believe it was in 19, or no, in um, 19, in 132 AD, that the... Roman Emperor Hadrian had renamed the land to be Syria-Palestina. 
And one of the thoughts of why he did that is because Israel continued to try to revolt against Rome. Remember, Rome came in and occupied the land, and Israel, who was in the land, were under Roman authority. And this was during the time of Christ, and they, many of the Jews thought Christ would deliver them from that Roman authority. But he was there to set up a different kingdom, the one you and I belong to. But what happened was is that this emperor changed the name of the land after one of the failed revolts that happened with Israel to Syria-Palestina. Many believe that the word actually came from an Egyptian word and a Hebrew word that referred to the inhabitants of that coastal region or basically the Philistines. And some believe that the reason that the emperor did that was to kind of destroy the morale of Israel. That we took away your title, we took away your name, we're taking away your claim to the land. And therefore, we will destroy the morality or the, the um, not morality, but the, the excitement and the, and the vibe of the, the people for their own land to, to have it back that that would wear on them from generation to generation. So here, as we see that, we see that Jerusalem at that time then, and that area became a Roman province. Now, in that area, the Philistines, or the name Palestine, or Palestinians, I'm sorry, the name Palestinians referred to that region or those living in that region. So at the time, those living in that region were Christian, were Jews, and were Arabs. So throughout history, you had Christian, Jews, and Muslims living in that land. In fact, most of the time, when Palestinian was used, it actually referred to the Jews in that region. None of the others. It referred mainly to the Jews. There was this educator and novelist, and his name is Kahalil Bidaz, and he, in 1898, coined the term of the Palestinians in reference to the Arab-speaking residents of that area. So, Palestinians was not a, a, a long-term understanding. It, it, it had not a national origin, really. It, it was just a reference to the people that were in that area. And for so many centuries, it mainly referred to the Jews. But those that were in that land were bent on a course to destroy the Jews, to remove them, to eliminate them, to exterminate all of them. And this heart continues to this day. There is no desire among those inhabitants to get along with Israel. The only desire is to destroy them completely. And thereby, I don't believe that there can ever be a two-state solution because if the other side wants you dead and the one side says we can live together in peace, there's no working that out. And Israel's been faced with this for a long time, and they finally realized that, that we can't have groups like Hamas on our border that with their only desire they have is our elimination. We can't have that. And I don't think we would tolerate that either if there was a border that we had where all they wanted to do was destroy me. 
there, there's not much of a, an ability to make peace. But this desire to destroy the Jews is a story that, that unfolds throughout history. In fact, one of the areas that this happened is back in the days of Pharaoh of Egypt. Remember in Exodus chapter 1, where Pharaoh realized that the Jews were growing in greater number than the, the Egyptians? And Pharaoh had said, if one of our enemies comes and attacks, the Jews, if they side with our enemy, we will be overthrown. And the Pharaoh did not want to lose his position on his throne. So what he did is he instructed that all the young babies, the male children, should be killed of the Hebrews when they're given birth. That he said, the number is too great, we're going to kill all the male children. Well, as the story unfolds, we realize that the scripture says that the midwives who helped give birth to those babies, they feared God, and they wouldn't do it. And because of that, many, many were saved. In fact, one that we know of named Moses. And Moses was spared. You can read about that in um, Exodus chapter 1, like verses 8 through 17, so that you can take a look at that. Now, you see on the surface, it looked like Pharaoh wanted to keep his throne. Yet if you look beyond that, above the humanity, above the display of pride and anger and hatred and war, there actually is another battle taking place, a spiritual battle. There's another person who does not want to give up his throne, and that's Satan himself. And, and what I want you to see is that in the things that we see happening on the earth, we just see the, the external things, but there is a whole spiritual battle taking place above those things. There are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places that are strategically planning, and the ultimate goal is that Satan doesn't want to lose his throne. He is called the God of this world. He doesn't want to give that up. And so though we see Pharaoh being motivated and moved, you know, with a, with a desire to keep his throne in Egypt and not to be dethroned, if you, if you view above that into the spiritual realm, there is another person sitting on a throne and Satan doesn't want to lose his. And he doesn't want a deliverer to come forth for the Jews in Egypt. And he also was moving on another man's heart that we know called King Herod. Remember when the wise men came to King Herod and they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And Herod had the scholars look, and they said, it's in Bethlehem. And Herod said, go pay homage to the, the, the young child, and then after you have, bring word back to me so that I may do the same. He didn't want to worship him. King Herod did not want to give up his seat on the throne. He didn't want to give it up to this king of the Jews. So when he knew that he was not listened to by the wise men, he sent into that land and killed all the children that were two years and younger. He wanted to stop a king from sitting on the throne. Well, again, if you look above that scenario, there was another one that was motivating King Herod. And it was Satan. Because he did not want the Son of God coming 
and claiming his right to the earth through the work of the cross. And so he motivated Herod to go in and try to eliminate the birth of Jesus Christ to, to, and if he couldn't stop it, to stop him from growing and becoming the Savior. And when we look at Scripture and we see this scenario unfolding, I can't help but see it happening today. That there are principalities and powers that are above the human leaders of today. And they are motivated by Satan himself who wants to be worshipped, who wants to be praised, who wants to be like God. And what we see unfolding before our eyes on this human plane is really a spiritual battle. It's taken place though we only see it with the, the chess pieces that are being moved, if you would. Between Herod and Pharaoh, there was a, another event found for us in Scripture. And that event is found in the book of Esther. Now, the events of the book of Esther happened about 30 years before Nehemiah why the Jews were still in captivity. And with the situation in the land of Persia, that there was this man named Mordecai. And he had a cousin named Esther. And she was very beautiful and of fair complexion. Very nice to look upon, I should say. Well, the king of Persia took her to be his wife. Now this is what's going to unfold in Esther chapter 3. So turn to Esther chapter 3. Just before Job, you'll find the book of Esther. Now, Mordecai, being a Jew, he was not going to worship any false gods. He wasn't going to bow down and worship men like a god. But there was a man named Haman in the land. He was called an Agagite, probably an Amalekite from the lineage of the king Agag, or Agag was a title of what would be a king in the land. And here, this Haman, when he was promoted to a position of honor and delighted in the praises of all the people, as he would pass by, the people would bow and they would reverence him and worship him. Now that fed Haman's ego quite a bit. So as he's going by and he's seeing all the people bowing as he passes by, there's one that is standing. And that irritated him to death. And he would pass by with everyone else bowing, and there Mordecai the Jew wouldn't bow to him. And it ate at him. He should worship me. He should bow to me. He should honor me. What really was happening above the scene is there's another one that wishes to be worshipped. And he is frustrated with those that won't. And his name is Satan. But here Haman, in his rage, as we will see, as we look in Esther, let's read verse 1 of chapter 3. And after these things did King Azuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. 
And all the king's servants that were in the gate, or the king's gate, bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did he reverence him. And the king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgressest thou the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, he hearkened not unto them. And they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And so they're like, why aren't you bowing? Why aren't you submitting? Why aren't you bowing before the, the, the known leader of this land right now? Why aren't you giving him homage and, and privilege? And Mordecai never did, no matter how much he was influenced and pressured, because his heart was for God and God alone. And I can tell you, anyone that takes that stand in this world will come under fire, will come under attack. That if you take a stand that I am not bowing to the edicts of this world that go against God, that I am not surrendering my worship to the one and true God and his only son, Jesus Christ, you're going to come under fire. And as the time lessens or hastens to the end, it's going to be more intense. They told him he didn't do it. They told him again he didn't submit. They told him again, and it didn't happen. And finally they said, Haman, what are you going to do with this Jew? He's not bowing to you. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did reverence him, then Haman was full of wrath. The amount of anger that had to be there, not only against Mordecai, but as you know the story, to take it out on the whole race of people, the Jews, can only be driven by Satan himself. Satan has that anger toward God and God's people. And do not be surprised if he moves his minions on this earth and those that are not followers of God against you. And that's what happened here. And so Haman was moved against him. And again, we know above the scene is Satan on the throne who desires to be worshipped, who claims himself to, to want to exalt his throne above the Most High. To the one that came to Jesus himself when Jesus was tempted and said, I will give you the kingdoms of the world if you worship me. The heart of Satan is to be worshipped. And unfortunately, many have lined up. Many are worshipping him openly, privately, and in ignorance. But there are those that will not. And there are those, the Jews of the time, that said no. And so the fury was so great against the Jews. Look what Haman says. And in verse 6 it says, And Haman, he, thought, scorned to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had showed him the people of Mordecai, whereas Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Azuerus, even the people of Mordecai. Now, you got to remember that Azuerus, or Xerxes, he is referred to, is the king of Persia. We know Persia as the people of Iran. And he is the king of that land. And so... It says that as we move on, that in the first month, that is the month of Nisan, 
in the twelfth year of King Azuerus, they cast pur, that is, the lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month to the twelfth month, that is, in the month of Adar. And Haman said unto King Azuerus, there is certain people scattered abroad, dispersed among the people in the province of the kingdom, and their laws are diverse from all the people. Neither keep they the king's law, neither is they not the king's prophet to suffer them. For or it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that they charge of the business to bring into the king's treasure. That here, these people, like Haman, they were upset that there is a group of people that will not obey their customs and their laws and their practices of worship. And so the solution is not to let them live and let live. The solution is to annihilate them. That is Islam today. In the radical understanding of Islam, if you do not obey the Sharia law and their customs and worship their God and their prophet Muhammad, then the only solution for you is annihilation, is complete death. And here it says, And the king said to Haman, The silver is given to thee and the people also to do with them as it seems good to thee. Now above the throne, and, and Azuerus had married a Jew and didn't realize it in marrying Esther, but nevertheless he was a puppet at the time. But the one pulling his strings was one who was seated on the throne, his own throne that he made. And that was Satan himself, or if you look at it this way through, through the book of Daniel, there was one called the Prince of Persia, who was a demonic being that was over the land of Persia to influence it for Satan, to, to affect it for Satan's kingdom. And what happened with this Prince of Persia moving upon Ezuerus, the king, he said, what you can do is you can go annihilate these people and I will pay for it. We look in modern time and we see that that prince of Persia, I believe, still exists over that land, which is Iran. And that prince of Persia has moved upon the Ayatollah and those in charge and said, we will pay and supply what is ever necessary to eradicate the land of the Jews, to eliminate all the Jews. In fact, as it unfolds, it says, and then were the king's scribe called on the 13th day of the first month, and there was written according to all Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants and to the governors that were over every province and to the rulers of every people that every province according to the writing thereof and to every people after their language in the name of the king Ezuerus was written and sealed with the king's ring that that decree would go forth against all the Jews everywhere. And then it says, And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces, in verse 13, to destroy, to kill, and cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day. Well, I believe we saw a reoccurrence of that desire on October 7th, when in one day, where the, the Hamas calls it the Alexis flood, 
And they sent their soldiers and paid for by Iran and trained by others to come into the land and wipe out men and women and children to rape, abuse, and kidnap all of them in one day. And it unfolded before our eyes. And we see history repeating itself because the entity over the land, the prince of Persia, the demonic influencer over the land, is still alive and well and continues with a hatred for God's people as he serves his master, Satan himself, who does not want to give up his throne. He doesn't want to give it up. And I believe that he thinks, though he's deceived, that he thinks if he eliminates the Jews, then the one who is proclaimed to come back and save all the Jews will not come back. And he can continue to keep his throne and rule over mankind. But again, he's deceived. Well, like before in the day of Esther, when God stepped in and did a miraculous thing and spared the Jews of that Holocaust, that I believe the only help for Israel is when God steps in to save his people. And believe me, he will. And when we move into uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, and we move into Zechariah, you'll see that. But anyways, again, we've got to see that above all the things that we see with our eyes, there's principalities and powers. There's rulers of darkness in high places. There's a throne that Satan wants to keep over mankind. And he will do everything he can to keep that throne. And again, he's doing everything he can to make the world ready for his minion that's going to come on the earth, the one that he's going to empower, which we call Antichrist. But we'll get into that uh, another study. Well, again, God will once again come in and save his people. But right now, I think it's important that we watch for greater involvement with Iran. We know Iran's already involved. We know that they have a desire to, to destroy all the Jews. But they don't want to stop with them. Remember, it was Iran that referred to America as the great Satan. And Israel is a little Satan. That they have a desire to kill all those that will not bow down and worship their God and follow their laws and their customs. And the enemy knows that the true Jews will not bow to any other God except Yahweh, Jehovah God. And the true born-again Christians are not going to bend a knee either. That I don't care if they have a hacksaw and they're coming before us by the grace of God, we will do not denounce Jesus Christ. That he is our Lord and Savior. And when you have groups of people that will not bow, then the solution that is on the heart of Satan through his people, eliminate them. We saw it with Haman. We see it today. I want to let you know that as you unfold Ezekiel 38 and 39, we see areas that the Bible mentions. We see the understanding of where it says about Gog and Magog. Now, Gog is a title. Magog is a land. Now, of the time, the land of Magog, and we'll get to this when we go into Ezekiel, was, was under the authority of the inhabitants called the Scythians. Well, they're not there anymore. But if you look close at the scripture, it doesn't talk about the people. It says Gog and the land of Magog. 
Well, who's there now? The Russians. The Russians are there. Who's to the north of Israel? Turkey. Who's also mentioned there? Mentioned of uh, Iran or Persia. We already see what's going on with Iran. And we already understand their heart against Israel. But let me share with you uh, something else about Russia. Here was an article this week. It said the prevailing, prevailing concept in Israel regarding its security relations with Rus Russia simply collapsed on October 7th. Still, signs of this collapse had already started to appear in 2014 with the annex of Crimea, and more so since the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And Millman said, he's a former Israeli ambassador to uh, Russia, last Tuesday, the UN restrictions on transferring missile technology to Iran had expired. And Russia said clearly that it need no longer obey these restrictions. That Russia made a statement when this expired, we no longer need to obey these restrictions. The moment Moscow estimates that reigning in Iran and Syria is no longer in their interest, things could change quickly. Well, what about Turkey? We know that there was trying to make peace and, and alliances with Turkey and with Egypt, with the Emirates. But these things are all failing and falling apart now. This is from the AP. Israel said Saturday that it was recalling its diplomats from Turkey over increasing harsh statements coming from the government in Ankara. The announcement came after Turkey's president told a massive protest crowd in Istanbul that his government was preparing to declare Israel a war criminal due to its actions in Gaza. Turkey is turning. Russia is turning. The Arab nations that the Bible speaks of in Ezekiel 38 are turning. Iran has already been turned. If you see those alliances coming together and the rhetoric that is already coming out of their mouth increasing, then I believe we're going to see Ezekiel 38 and 39 unfold. That we'll, we'll see those things. What about America? America has had the right words. But as you have read and seen, brewing within our government is such anti-Semitism, such hatred for God's people, that I believe that America will find themselves on the wrong side of this issue. Through its stupidity, its demonic influence. Remember, if there's a prince of Persia that's over the land, a demonic force trying to influence the land of Persia, you can guarantee there's one over America. In fact, many of you probably have seen the influence of demonic forces even upon our own politicians. It has changed. When I was a kid, there was disagreements. And one way thought their way was best. But now, I tell you, there are times that it's pure evil. And you see certain politicians and you look in their eyes and you're like, that is just evil. It, 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 it is gone to a, a bad place. So can America continue its stand? Well, according to the scriptures, I believe that every nation will turn against Israel. And as this war continues to drag on, 
the, the, the media and the influence from the prince and power of the air, Satan himself is turning what was a compassionate heart toward Israel on October 7th to a hatred toward Israel and a stand for Hamas and the Palestinians. You, you just see it turn before our very eyes. There's influences above the human level that is creating that environment. And as far as America, this was in the Wall Street Journal. It said that Iran signed off on Hamas assault on Israel. And this should jolt President Biden from his failed Iran strategy. Now I want you to know that I am not taking a side of Republican or Democrat. I would report on what's going on regardless of who is in the White House. If it's coming and, and, and have a basis that's in Scripture and current events, I don't care what they title themselves. But what I care about is what's happening. And what has happened is that it says a place to start would be honest about how the U.S. policy has financed Iran's support for Hamas. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken insisted over the weekend that the $6 million the administration unfroze in exchange for the release of five American prisoners wasn't used to attack Israel. It says that, no, no, that money was meant for food and, and medicines and medical equipment, and, and we have a desire, and, and our, we're making sure that it only goes to that. Well, money is fluid, interchangeable. If I'm a country and I'm spending $6 billion on food and medicine and medical equipment, and someone's going to give me $6 billion for that, I'll take that money and spend it on ammunition and war and rockets, and then that money comes in and, oh, it's only being used for medicine. And as one who would be given that money, being like, well, good, then that's what it was intended for. That is either ignorant or, or willful or I don't know what. That's wrong. But it also says that Iran has, uh, more importantly, the U.S. has throttled back enforcement of oil sanctions which has given Tehran billions more dollars to finance Hamas and Hezbollah and other terrorist proxies. Iran's oil production jumped to 3 million barrels a day in August from 2.6 in April, according to the Organization of the Petroleum Export Countries data. Iran's oil minister said in August that the country's oil production would hit 3.4 million barrels a day by the end of September, the highest since 2018 when the Trump administration had imposed sanctions. This increase of oil is being sold to China. And so now Iran is getting very wealthy off the sale of oil that has been allowed to happen currently. And what does Iran do with that increase of money? Well, of course, they care for their poor and sick and their needy. And they take care of the widows and the little ones. They don't. What they do is they fuel war and terrorism. That's what they do. But anyways, this is what's going, and I just believe under our current situation that I believe that America will find itself on the wrong side. And, and don't, I don't want that. Believe me, I'm not looking for that. But if you look in over our history, America's been on the wrong side of the things of God for a while now. Abortion, homosexuality, gender identity, moral behavior. We continue to be on the wrong side of God. In fact, I think it's important that we examine our lives to find out, Lord, help me to be on the right side. During the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was asked if God was on his side. And this is how he replied. Sir, 
My concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on 